like what's what is substrate level phosphorylation? What do we mean by that? And this is a little cartoon that kind of illustrates very simply what this refers to. So the idea with substrate level phosphorylation is that we actually have an enzyme that's able to bind to a molecule of ADP. So this is adenosine uh, diphosphate. So it has the alpha and beta phosphates on it. It doesn't have a gamma phosphate, the last one on the, of the three. And so it binds to this molecule of ADP, and it also binds to a substrate that has a phosphate group on it. And then it, uh, it actually is able to use that phosphate to phosphorylate the ADP molecule and generate a molecule of ATP while releasing a product that is simply this uh, molecule over here missing the phosphate group. Okay, so this is what we mean by substrate level phosphorylation. It's an enzyme that binds to a phosphorylated substrate and transfers that phosphate group to ADP to synthesize ATP. Okay, so I want to now just uh, go through the start going through the steps of um, of glycolysis, and um, you know basically this is a pathway that harvests chemical energy by oxidizing glucose to pyruvate. And so this is a word that really literally means the splitting of sugar. Right? It's glyco, which is the sugar, and lysis is breakage. So we're actually breaking sugar. Uh, we're breaking it down into two molecules of pyruvate. And as we said, this is going on in the cytoplasm, and it has two major phases. There's an um, initial phase where we have to actually invest energy. We have to burn molecules of ATP to get it going. And then in the second phase is, is the stage that we call the energy payoff phase. That's the part of the cycle where we actually um, are able to generate um, uh, molecules of ATP in addition to the ones that we had to burn in the first place. So we end up with a net gain in ATP molecules that are produced in this pathway, even though we initially have to burn a couple of them to get it going. Um, the next slide just shows uh, kind of the overview of what's happening in the pathway. So, uh, so we have this energy investment phase. And the idea here is that we have to burn two molecules of ATP. Um, and these are, this, when I say burn, I just mean, I mean that two molecules of ATP are being hydrolyzed such that their terminal phosphate, the gamma phosphate, is cleaved off. Right? And as you know, that's a, an energetically favorable reaction. So as we're going to see, we have to do this in glycolysis because it's a way of, um, of essentially priming the glucose molecule for uh, chemical breakdown by making it, a more, making it a more favorable for that molecule to be broken down once it's been phosphorylated. Okay, but that means that we have to invest that energy, energy of uh, cleavage of these two ATP molecules to get the cycle uh, going in the first place. It's also a way to, to essentially commit the pathway. Right? So once these molecules are uh, have been hydrolyzed and the, the phosphate groups have been transferred to glucose, it's a way of committing that phosphorylated glucose molecule for uh, breakdown in the pathway. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a moment. Okay, so that's, um, that's the initial investment phase. And then we have the phase in the middle here, uh, the, the second phase, which is this energy payoff phase. And the idea here is that this is where we're actually generating uh, molecules of ATP. So um, during this uh, payoff phase, there actually are four molecules of ADP, adenosine diphosphate, that become phosphorylated to ATP. So four ATPs are formed. And again, those are made by substrate level phosphorylation, where, where we actually have an enzyme that is bound to a phosphorylated molecule and is able to transfer that phosphate group directly to ADP to make ATP and then release it. Okay, so substrate level phosphorylation. And then uh, in, in this payoff phase, we also have transfer of electrons to NAD plus to produce two molecules of NADH. And as you'll see later, those also then are very useful during oxidative phosphorylation for uh, generating ATP molecules. So it's, a very, um, it's, a, it's another way that the cell is harvesting energy from the breakdown of glucose during this cycle to use later uh, to generate molecules of ATP. Right? And so uh, at the end of all of this, we have two molecules of pyruvate, these three carbon um, uh, molecules, plus uh, two uh, water molecules. And if we just do the, do the math here, what we see is that this is the overall reaction that's going on, where glucose is being broken down to pyruvate and water. We have four ATP molecules that are made, but we had to use two to get the cycle going in the first place. So overall, we get two ATP molecules made per cycle of glycolysis. And we also get two molecules of NADH that are made that are used for later. All right, so let's, let's just, um, we're going to walk through the, the steps of glycolysis. And, um, and I guess what's important to say here is that, um, you know, so students always ask, you know, do I, have to, do I have to memorize all the structures of the molecules in the pathway? And do I need to memorize the names of all the enzymes? But what I would say is that you definitely need to know, uh, you know, uh, you need to know what glucose looks like, right? Because we talk about that a lot. So you need to know uh, what glucose looks like. Um, you need to know that the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate. And, um, and you need to know what happens in terms of the production of ATP and NADH during the cycle, right? Each turn of the, of, of the glycolytic pathway, how, how much are we getting in each of those types of molecules? I don't expect you to memorize the names of all of the enzymes and the structures of all of the intermediate compounds in the pathway, but I do want you to know how many steps are involved. I do want you to know um, the, the, some of the properties of the enzymes that I'm specifically going to tell you about today. Okay, I'll, I'll make a point of, of, of emphasizing it to you. Okay, so to get the whole cycle going, uh, we have glucose that comes into the cell. And of course, this, this molecule is pretty hydrophilic, right? It's pretty hydrophilic. So it gets into the cell. It's, it's soluble. It gets into the cytosol quite, quite readily. And, um, and so the first thing that happens when it uh, enters the glycolytic pathway is that it gets phosphorylated by an enzyme called hexokinase. Hexokinase. So hexo, of course, is six. And kinase, you might remember, is the word that we use for enzymes that put a phosphate on something, right? So there's all sorts of kinases in the cell. And this is one of them, hexokinase. And this is the first enzyme in the pathway whose job is to phosphorylate this glucose molecule. And in the process, of course, we have to hydrolyze one molecule of ATP. So this is where we, this is, this is of course, the energy investment phase. This is where we're first investing some energy in the pathway by putting a phosphate onto the glucose molecule. Now, a couple things happen when, uh, when glucose gets phosphorylated. First of all, now it's, a, now it's a charged molecule, right? We're not showing you the explicit structure of this phosphate group, but if you look at the structure, it's actually charged. And so once it's phosphorylated, it's a lot harder for glucose to get across the cell membrane and go back out. So it basically is a way of trapping this uh, phosphorylated glu glucose molecule in the cell. And by, uh, by Le Chatelier's principle, it actually drives the equilibrium of uh, glucose entering the cell, right? It effectively depletes the concentration of glucose in the cell by converting it to this glucose 6-phosphate uh, molecule and, and um, drives the, the uh, transport of more glucose into the cell. So that's one thing that this uh, enzyme is able to achieve. And Exokinase was one of the um, one of the enzymes who, whose crystal structure was was uh, first determined very early on in, in the field of protein X-ray crystallography when people were just learning how to how to crystallize and solve structures of these kinds of enzymes. And this was done in Tom Spice's lab at Yale. They solved the structure of hexokinase and beautifully could observe that this enzyme has an active site. It's designed to bind to uh, to uh, to ATP and to glucose and bring these two substrates together so that the reaction is uh, able
other proteins that will affect its activity depending on whether the cell needs to generate more energy by breaking down uh, glucose or not. All right, and then the second step in the pathway is just a, uh, a reaction that isomerizes the glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. And that reaction is shown right here, catalyzed by phosphoglucoisomerase, the second enzyme in the pathway. And, um, and this is a, a place where if we have fructose coming into the cell, uh, it actually doesn't have to be first converted to glucose and start at the, the initial step. It can actually enter the glycolytic pathway at this step right here by becoming uh, phosphorylated by other enzymes that will then allow it to, to jump right into the pathway at this step. And then the third step in the pathway is the, is the second place where we have to actually invest a molecule of ATP. And this is shown right here. Now, this is a, a very, very important step in glycolysis. It's catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphofructokinase, or PFK for short. So again, you see the kinase word there. So you know this is a, an enzyme that puts a phosphate onto something. And again, this is a substrate-level phosphorylation reaction where, um, um, wait, that's, sorry, that, take that back. That's, that's when we're talking about synthesis of ATP. Take that back. But, it, but the point is it's binding to ATP, and it's binding to uh, fructose 6-phosphate. And it's uh, basically taking a phosphate group off the ATP molecule and transferring it onto the sugar. And when it does that, it makes a, uh, a molecule that now has two phosphates on it, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. This is very important because this is going to directly precede the breakdown of this molecule into, um, into three carbon uh, molecules that, that then ultimately are converted to pyruvate. So a couple things that I want to tell you about uh, uh, phosphofructokinase. So it's an interesting enzyme. It's actually a four uh, subunit enzyme. So it's a tetrameric enzyme. And, and furthermore, it's called a homotetramer, a homotetramer, because all four of the subunits look the same. They're all, they're all the same. Uh, polypeptides. And because this is such an important step in the glycolytic pathway, it's really the, the step where the pathway is now really committed, right? We've got these, we've invested two molecules of ATP at this point. We've got this uh, sugar that has two phosphates on it. It's ready for further breakdown. And so this is an enzyme that is, is highly regulated. And it uh, is an enzyme that is, is in fact allospherically regulated, right? So it turns out there's an allospheric binding site on phosphofructokinase for uh, ATP that is an inhibitory site. So if there's a lot of ATP in the cell, the cell is very, uh, very uh, rich in, in energy currency, then ATP can actually bind to PFK in such a way that the enzyme is, is actually inhibited from carrying out this reaction. And how do we know this? Well, we know it in a couple of different ways. First of all, we can do um, biochemical experiments with purified phosphofructokinase and show that at very high concentrations of ATP, we can inhibit this, this reaction. Another way that we know it is, again, from X-ray crystallography. So there's been a lot of work done on the structures of uh, phosphofructokinase enzymes from different organisms. And so we know what these molecules look like. We know what they look like in the APO state, which means in the state where they don't have any substrates or, or inhibitors bound to them. We also know what they look like um, in, their, in their holo enzyme state, where they have uh, substrates bound. And we can see these allosteric regulatory sites that, when occupied by ATP, tend to, um, tend to inhibit the activity of the enzyme. So PFK is a very um, important uh, enzyme in this, in this whole process because it is the point where, at this point, the pathway is really committed. Right, so, so once we have this uh, diphosphorylated sugar, this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate molecule, then in the next step of the pathway, an enzyme called aldolase is able to cleave it into these two uh, three-carbon compounds. Now, they're different, right? So one of them is a ketone, dihydroxyacetone phosphate. The other one is an aldehyde, glyceraldehyde uh, 3 phosphate. And so they each have phosphates on, but their structures are a little bit different. And it turns out that only the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is competent to go through the next step in the pathway. And so to deal with that, we have an enzyme called an isomerase, whose job is to uh, catalyze the isomerization of dihydroxyacetone phosphate to uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Right? So this is a reversible reaction, but because glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate is very rapidly uh, entering the next step in the glycolytic pathway. Again, that will tend to drive the equilibrium in this direction so that we end up with more of this and these molecules get fed into the downstream step of the pathway. All right, and so now we have uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. And now what you see is that because we started off with a six carbon sugar and we're now talking about three carbon compounds, we have to, to keep our uh, equations balanced. We have to show this with a two, right? So we've got two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate that are produced for every molecule of glucose that's entering the pathway. And in the next reaction, um, we start to actually uh, uh, gain back some of the the, uh, capture some of the energy that is generated in this, in this catabolic process in the form of molecules that are ultimately going to be useful for uh, generating ATP. So in this reaction here, which is uh, catalyzed by an enzyme that your book calls triosphosphate dehydrogenase, I guess I've always called it glyceraldehyde phosphate uh, dehydrogenase, or GAP-DH is the way that we uh, will abbreviate this. Um, but the bottom line is that this is an enzyme whose job is to, um, is to um, put a phosphate onto this uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate molecule to produce this molecule right here, 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate. And in the process, this is an electron uh, transfer reaction that takes two molecules of NAD plus and converts them to two molecules of NADH. Right? And so again, that's sort of an investment for the future. These NADH molecules, as we'll see, are going to be very useful um, in oxidative phosphorylation for generating uh, molecules of ATP. All right, and so then we have the next step. We have a um, reaction catalyzed by the enzyme phosphoglycerokinase. So again, you see kinase, and you know that uh, there's some kind of transfer of uh, phosphate that's going on. Now, in this case, this actually is a substrate level phosphorylation the way that we've talked about it with the transfer of the phosphate onto a molecule of ADP to produce ATP. And of course, um, we have to put a two there, right, a two here, because again, for every six carbon glucose that enters the pathway, we've got two of these three carbon molecules that are made in the, in the process. And so we, um, in this step, we actually generate uh, two molecules of ATP, and we produce a molecule called three phosphoglycerate, the single uh, phosphate on it there. And uh, this is then converted in it with an enzyme called phosphoglycerobutase to 2-phosphoglycerate, and we're almost there. Uh, we have a, an enzyme called enolase that converts the 2-phosphoglycerate to phosphoenol pyruvate, which is this, again, a three-carbon uh, molecule here. And then finally, uh, in, this, in, the second, uh, in the last reaction of glycolysis and the, uh, the second reaction that involves substrate-level phosphorylation where we're generating molecules of ATP, we have an enzyme called pyruvate kinase whose job is to take this phosphate group and transfer it back to ADP to generate ATP. So pyruvate kinase is also a molecule, an enzyme that's catalyzing substrate-level phosphorylation to generate uh, ATP in the process. And so then we, we end up with uh, pyruvate and, of course, two molecules of pyruvate for each uh, molecule of glucose that enters the pathway. And as I mentioned, these pyruvate molecules are then, uh, they don't, it, things don't really stop there. They actually, these pyruvate molecules are then immediately um, able to enter the mitochondrion. And when they get inside the mitochondrion, they start uh, being broken down further 
in the citric acid cycle, or the TCA cycle. And in the process of the TCA cycle, as we're going to see, we're also going to end up with a net two ATP molecules that are synthesized. So very important to remember that in glycolysis, um, you should know what the overall uh, gain in, in uh, sort of the energy currency type molecules is. So we get two molecules of ATP that, as a net gain in glycolysis, and we also get uh, two molecules of NADH. So you should know that, know the, the sort of the, the structures of the starting and ending molecules, so the structure of like uh, glucose and of pyruvate. And I would like you to know the key, uh, those two key regulatory enzymes that we mentioned specifically, so hexokinase, which is the very first enzyme in the pathway, and then phosphofructokinase, which is the enzyme that catalyzes really the, the sort of the um, commitment step of the glycolytic pathway. So please uh, be familiar with those. And when you come in on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the uh, citric acid cycle and what happens next.